Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, let's see. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, um, my name is Neil Stevenson. I work at Hazelcast, and uh, I have half an hour to tell you about distributed tracing of microservices. I have about 20 slides and a demo, which you can download after. Uh, and I'll be around for questions if you don't want to go straight for lunch. Hopefully you've uh, seen the talk outline on Shed, so I'll skip past that. Um, what I want to talk about very briefly is what I mean by microservice. Um, then we'll go into a tool called Zipkin, which is going to do the actual tracing for us. Uh, a mention about what Hazelcast adds to this piece. And then finally a demo. So um, we all kind of have an idea of what a microservice is. Uh, I've never met two people with the same idea. So as far as I'm concerned, a, a microservice is just a, a bit. It might do a little. It might do a lot. Um, mainly seems to be REST-based um, from what I see. REST and JSON has won the battle um, in terms of communication between services, easy for humans to, to test. So um, my microservice today is based around the idea of credit cards. We've all done things with credit cards where we've, uh, we have a balance, we have a credit limit, we've done some transactions, and we do authorizations. Um, Authorizations are, are the, the, the clever one. That's when you, you checked into the hotel, they kind of put a hold on some money on your card. It doesn't cost you anything, but it stops you spending that money. So um, what that means is that changes your available credit. You've actually spent 100 euros, you've had 50 on hold, so 150 euros of your credit is earmarked. So the web front end I, I've got here is, uh, not very good. I'm a, a back-end developer. But the microservices are just REST-based. They're just doing five simple things. Look up the users in the system. Look up somebody's transactions. The important one is number three, because number three calls four and five. And this is where the tracing starts to become relevant, because one of those is misbehaving, is running slowly, and I need to find out which one. So I'm getting a, a poor user experience on the front end. Uh, and how do I trace that down at the back end when it's running different processes on different hosts? What's the bottleneck? Where is it going wrong? So that's what the tracing is about. Um, the tracing solution itself is a, a product called Zipkin, uh, which is free, open source. You can download it from Zipkin.io. It's on GitHub. Uh, it grew out of a, a Google project, uh, a thing called Dapper. Um, so the idea is around tracing. Um, and what they mean by tracing is two concepts, spans and traces. Uh, a trace is just the start and stop of an operation, in and out of a method, the, the usual kind of stuff. The span is where that is uh, like an umbrella, where operation one calls operation two, operation three, and so on. Uh, and how it works it is just it sneaks some extra data into the HTTP headers. So you get in an incoming header, uh, which is blank, so you're the top level operation, you get an incoming header which is non-blank, you're a child operation. And hopefully how we'll, we'll see it on screen is uh, across the, the top we have one long operation that took uh, 30 seconds to execute. We can look down, that's been broken down. This middle call, that took oh, a large amount of time called some other operations that were very quick, so that tells us all the time is being spent in this middle layer. It's not spending a lot of time retrieving data from elsewhere. It's spending all the time on its own processing. So maybe it's got an inefficient algorithm. Who knows? So the original architecture of Zipkin is that you have a, a monolith, a process that does everything. So we have the user interface in there, we have um, the traces being stored in there, and we have a, a storage mechanism uh, for the traces. 
Uh, and that's okay, but that's kind of not what we want. So we want to get rid of that storage from the Zipkin server. Um, it provides a few options in terms of service. Um, so Zipkin can store in Cassandra. That was what it was originally intended for. Zipkin can store in MySQL. Zipkin can store in memory, uh, which is fast, but not really as far as they're concerned for production. It's just a dev and test option because you're just running a JVM and memory's going to run out. So what we're looking at is, is there another way with Zipkin? Uh, and in terms of adding it to the project, it's super, super easy. If you're in Spring Boot land, you just need Spring application name and add one dependency. And then Spring Boot does everything else for you. So perhaps that's the takeaway from today. Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin pulls in all the PCs you need, does all the things you want. So Zipkin is the monitoring framework, uh, the tracing framework. Uh, it can store somewhere. Uh, and this is where Hazelcast comes in. Um, Hazelcast is my employer. Um, I'm not entirely impartial here. Uh, You've probably heard of Hazelcast in a kind of interchangeable way with the software product. We actually have two. We have uh, IMDG at the top, in-memory data grid, uh, which is what we'll talk about next. Uh, and we have another thing called JET, which is uh, streaming analytics, which is not relevant for today's talk. So um, the idea of an in-memory data grid is some Java processes that host some data in memory. Um, no great surprise. The, the, there's a, it's like a, a toolbox. There's lots of features in there, but the one that matters is we have an implementation of MAP, which is spread across multiple JVMs with the ability to query data, to have indexes, to run processing on data, expiry, search, all sorts of things that you don't generally get with Java maps. So if we look at what a Hazelcast cluster looks like, it's a collection of processes. Uh, and the key part, which um, I've tried to get in this diagram, is that the data is striped across the processes. That's what the light green boxes are. My Java util map is cut up into bits and shared out amongst the available servers. Uh, and the darker green boxes are mirror copies. So I can cope with servers going off the air. I can scale up and down my capacity using the on-demand broker, for example. Um, so that's what gives me the storage I want for Zipkin, because it's in memory, so it's fast, but it's resilient and out of the process for the Zipkin server, so I'm not worried about running out of space. I can manage that capacity independently. Think of it, well, it's not really a database, but think of it like a database. I've got the best of both worlds. I don't have the, the slowness that you get from the disk, but I don't have to worry about the Zipkin server itself running out of capacity, because I've offloaded to another server. Uh, and this is Java processes. They're very easy for Spring Boot. Um, but we have lots of ways to connect to them. That took a long time on PowerPoint, just that one animation. We have got a, a range of clients that connect. Um, as far as we're concerned, today it's a Java client for the Zipkin server connecting to a Java process. You can access that map as if it's in your memory. It's actually spread across the memory of other processes. So it's time for my demo. Um, it's got a couple of bits where I'm half in and half out of Cloud Foundry. I've decided to run my top level application in Cloud Foundry. I've decided to run my microservices out uh, for no particular reason other than this is the kind of jumble that you normally have to deal with. It's nice if you've got a greenfield where you do everything right to begin with, but in big businesses, they've already got apps and there might be a transition process. So um, how my application looks, I'm the user on the left. I talk to the web application, which is in blue and in Cloud Foundry, which makes calls to my five microservices. I'm, I'm only running one instance of each. I don't have, it's on my laptop, it's not enough for clustering. Uh, and those are retrieving data from Hazelcast. And then what the monitoring does is it adds an extra process for the Zipkin server 
and the microservices are sending REST calls to the Zipkin server saying this is a trace. Um, the Zipkin server is saving that in Hazelcast as well, and the UI lets us browse them. So, time for a demo. Let's hope this um, works on the network here. So, I'm in SDS. We all see that okay? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I have the Zipkin server, all these objects, I will uh, start. And while I'm doing that, I will deploy my app to Cloud Foundry. The only bar I had to change today is just my IP address for my app that's in Cloud Foundry to reach outside. Um, there's better ways to do that, but this is just a demonstration. You know, really, you would want to use a config server and have all that kind of stuff. Um, derived rather than um, hard coded. So let's just wait for everything to start up on my laptop. How are we doing? Everything's chugging away. So while that's going, I'll start some other processes. There's my app there. Yeah, my app is there, so. So everything is up and running, all my microservices are running, and my app is still deploying. There we go, still going. So while I'm waiting on that, what I'll do is I'll go to my, um, I did briefly mention that Hazelcast has a uh, commercial side. I can monitor my maps on my Hazelcast application. So I can have a look at my credit card authorizations. I have two on this JVM. I can look at my transactions. I'm really just um, able to browse map content. So what I want to do here, here's my app, is it actually started yet? Let's try it and see. All right, so my app is up and running. Um, like I say, it's not the best web development application in the world, um, that's not my thing. And when I look at my um, users in my system, I've got uh, seven users. I select one, let's pick me, and then what we see is there's some operations in the background you might have seen on the console, um, but my uh, balances show me I've got a credit limit of 100 and available credit of zero. I can click down and see, oh well, I've, I took an Uber and I've had a pizza, and this is the one that's put me out of balance, I have an authorizations. We're not interested in the app. What we are interested in though is Zipkin. So I can go to my Zipkin server. It's picked up that it has traces for app from my Spring application name. That's my top level. I can see what traces are available. Uh, if I click on that trace, I can see that that top level call to find users made a call to this, which made a call to this, this call, and this call, and this call. And if we look at that, that operation took a set amount of time. It's like there's the incoming call, there's the response. So I can trace all of what's going on. Um, the part that matters more is the visual. You can see that the end-to-end -end of that operation was 1.7 seconds, and that that bit didn't take particularly long, but this took a large amount of time. That's the span with the traces underneath. So that's the part that's showing me uh, what's going on. And I can run these operations directly. I can look at my balance uh, from a REST call, not particularly exciting. I can look at my transactions from a REST call. So these are all the, the microservices. So 
that's the, the demonstration app. The app isn't important. The part that matters is that to instrument it, you just turn on sampling. So the core thing is a, a tool called Sleuth. So it's Spr Spring Cloud Sleuth is the thing that's wrapping up the Zipkin calls. And this is where it's sending the traces. So this is just a URL. And that's the URL that I called to browse the traces. So I can see, drill down into individual operations. I can look at microservice three and see what microservice three is doing. And this is where we get back into the, the same diagram. So if you have a hierarchy of microservices, you can add traces if you've got REST calls. And then the last piece of this is these REST calls, Zipkin spans are stored in Hazelcast. Uh, we can see that uh, the servers are there. There are two JVMs running, storing data and mirrored data. So if I really wanted to, I can shut down my service, go back to my application, and it's still working. Because I've been cheating, I'm running another copy in that window. So I'm running a cluster of two JVMs, and I've only killed off one. Um, so that was a little bit fast through the slides. But the, the key part, really, is that this is just a dependency to add. You just add Spring Cloud Star to Zipkin to your POM or, or Gradle or whatever you're, you're using. If you've got a Spring application name, that gets tagged in, if you look in the console, which one am I finding? If I find one of my microservices, then there you can see the trace information going out. There is the microservice name. There is the trace ID, which is just a UUID. So that's how it ties everything together. You're passing in the parent, uh, and you pass out parent and child, and it says, ah, this is the child of that operation. It can build up the hierarchy on the Zipkin server. So what matters is your application name and your YAML. And your, here's my POM. So I'm pulling in Hazelcast, Timeleaf for my web, Zipkin for monitoring, that's it. Couldn't get much simpler than that. Could get a little simpler, but we're down to four dependencies, so it's really not that many to manage. Uh, and the part that uh, I'm personally working on at the moment is this Zipkin storage Hazelcast. Um, so adding Hazelcast as a storage type to Zipkin, uh, it's still a work in progress. Zipkin is itself evolving. So uh, this works on version 128. The current version, Zipkin 2, I'm still working on. So that will get pushed uh, in a week or two or however long it takes me. So um, that's the end for today. This was just a kind of lightning cover of um, how you add Zipkin to applications. Very, very easy. Uh, there's lots of resources you can go and look at. The one that matters really is uh, the Open Tracing Organization. That tells you all about, um, th these slides are on, uh, uploaded them to Shed so you can download them. Um, but obviously that then, you've got to log in to Shed and so that's all there. Um, the code itself is on github, github.com slash Neil Stevenson, so that's me. If, uh, I'll stop in a second and we'll, we'll run into some questions, but if there's any question you think of afterwards, then neil at hazelcast.com keeps it nice and easy. So that's me. Questions? So the question was, how do you set up Zipkin to use Hazelcast? And there we go. 
So on my Zipkin server, if I look at the configuration, then all I do is add an argument, um, Zipkin storage type equals Hazelcast. Um, uh, and if you're working on my build, then that creates some spring beans that do create a uh, Zipkin internally has an interface for storing the spans and for searching the spans. So uh, ordinarily that goes on to something like a, a rows and columns database and you have to index it for fast retrieval. All that I'm doing is providing Zipkin as a client to call off to Hazelcast and I'm storing that data in Hazelcast memory across multiple processes in a map and I can retrieve that quickly because the maps are indexed on Hazelcast. So there's a couple of things that Hazelcast adds that are kind of useful. Um, one is you can expire data. You can say to Hazelcast, this data that I've written in, uh, delete it after a day, and it will delete it for you. Because otherwise, you, your collection of traces will be enormous. It will be run out forever, and you'd have to do some sort of um, archiving, which uh, wouldn't be the hardest thing in the world. And, and archiving really would mean take it out and throw it away. You're not usually interested in old trace information. This is just a, a thing that you can add and say let's trace what's going on in dev and test. And because it's HTTP protocol, it's easy to go in and out of Cloud Foundry or, or uh, you don't have to mess about with routes and things. So that makes life simpler, particularly if you've got legacy applications and new applications, you're going to have that mixed deployment model. More questions? Maybe a follow-up then. Um, you also stream at Cassandra at the same time. So you've got... Uh, you know, yeah. Time. OK. Well, your, your question is, can you have it? Yes, you could do that, but you would have to do, uh, do it in a different way. Zipkin can only send its um, traces to one place. Yeah. So it could send it to Cassandra or to Hazelcast, which wouldn't solve your problem, but you can send data to Hazelcast and get Hazelcast to send it on, which is um, what I'm doing on my database is um, right through or right behind. Um, on a Hazelcast map, uh, you can attach um, you can attach a storage class which is responsible for every time you write into Hazelcast, write it somewhere else, such as Cassandra. So you would have the benefit of in-memory speed. Uh, you might expire things out of memory, but hold them for longer on Cassandra and, and housekeep them after a month. You might have today's traces in memory, so you've got blazing fast access to those, and historical traces for a month on disk, and then discard them from there. And that's how you configure the expiry. In this case, it was your um, authorizations. Anybody that's ever done anything with credit cards, you, you swipe your card and it just holds an amount for a couple of days until the corresponding transaction comes through. So, um, so this is how we configure a map in Hazelcast. We're adding expiry. Easy peasy. Throw it away after, what's that, 3600? What's that, one day? Half a day? Can't remember now. Doesn't really matter. No, that's an hour, in fact, if it's seconds. So just as a last part, one thing around connectivity is how do processes find each other? You know, it's, um, we don't really want to hard code IP addresses and 127001 isn't a particularly scalable solution. Um, so you can have discovery plugins, you can hard code your, uh, your IP addresses, you can pick them up from Zookeeper, all sorts of ways. One of the biggest challenges of Cloud Foundry is just finding where all the machines are. You know, somebody spins it up, and that was why on my example, on the front page, you can get at the um, VCAP app, uh, VCAP services, and uh, when you create Hazelcast client, uh, normally that would be inside Cloud Foundry, and then you'd look up to find out where the service actually is bound to, and use that IP address. More questions? We've got five minutes to lunch.
No? Yeah, can you go? Uh, Yeah, um, if you want to run Hazelcast on Cloud Foundry, you can run, um, let's see if the Wi-Fi's up. Uh, 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 you can run it as an on-demand broker if you've got um, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So you can get ODB to spin up however many instances you care about, um, and it'll do that by interacting with Bosch. So that'll create a clustered service of whatever size you've configured for, uh, and it'll do rolling bounces and all the kind of nice stuff that you want. So if you're saying, uh, make some change, then you take one node off the air uh, and bring it back and then do the next one, um, and you can do a rolling change to your cluster without ever it going off the air, and Bosch is bright enough to talk to Hazelcast and say, are you actually happy? Because it's not enough to say the JVM has started, it's an, it's you have to then say, well, make sure all the everything's heated itself up and it's all ready to go before you do the next one. Um, so it's fine for controlled rollout, and if obviously you have a machine failure, it'll start up another one for you. It's no different a procedure. Uh, but that's only from version 1.8 onwards, uh, which shouldn't really be a problem. What are we on now, 1.10, 1.11? Um, and then you can define it as a, a user um, in use cups, and you can make your own Hazelcast service, and then you need to be able to create instances off that service, and then it's just a binding between the client and the server. So that's uh, that part's easy. User provider service is a bit fiddly, but uh, once you've done it once, you just copy it and paste it for the next one. So it's really not difficult to use the. the uh, the PCF tile thing is just an enhancement, makes it very, very simple, but if you, you're coding it by hand, it's not, not the hardest thing in the world. Um, because it's, you know, Cloud Foundry Foundation Silver members, it's like we're not honed in on Pivotal. It's like Cloud Foundry runs in Cloud Foundry, you've got Bluemix or any other, then we're fine with that. At the end of the day, Hazelcast is just a Java process. You run it inside a Spring Boot deployable jar file. Trivial. OK. Um, oh, one more question. Yes. I didn't quite hear your question. You're asking, can when Hazelcast connects to an external store? Yeah. I'm still not 100% sure I'm following your question, but. Basically, if an external store is only external to Hazelcast, if it's internal to Cloud Foundry, all that really matters is the connection string information. So, you know, what's the IP address? What's the logon password? If it's like, a, you know, if that was like an up MySQL instance running inside Cloud Foundry, you should be able to connect to that as long as there's no kind of. Um, the problem really is the network routes. If you're outside trying to connect inside and TCP gets blocked or all that, that's the 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 difficulty. It's not insurmountable, it's just a, a bit fuss. If it, everything's inside, then it's a lot simpler because Cloud Foundry is just looking after the boundary. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy lunch. <laughs>